the event coming in September. Very excited for a lot of good things going on. And then um, hopefully you can see this on the camera since a little bit farther, far away, but if you haven't already heard about the Parkinson's tulip, this is the Parkinson's tulip. Uh, and I don't know how long ago it was actually developed uh, for James Parkinson's in honor of him, but this is an actual Parkinson's tulip. You can get them. I've seen them more out of Canada, but I, you, I know you can get them uh, all over. But so be just beautiful. So when you see some of the other organizations like the National Parkinson's Foundation and some of those, they show a tulip. That's why. So um, I can't think. Was there anything else I was... Okay, so Okay, so I, I was just talking to Jackie Ewell, our volunteer, and Ed Ewell's um, wife, uh, and she's the one that brought it. And if you ever order one, um, you can actually order them, but you have to give them a, a description of black and white stripes, or excuse me, red and white stripes, because sometimes it's hard to get the Parkinson's one. But anyways, it's beautiful. And oh, lastly, um, next month. Uh, our telehealth speaker is uh, Dick Sayer of Sayer and Sayer, attorney at law for elder, um, elder law, and he's going to be speaking on elder law and long-term care. Uh, he will have handouts, different things. If you can, um, I know all the sites are booked between two and four. If you can plan on possibly having a little bit longer time for that presentation. Uh, we've been, we've had a lot of requests for long-term care, um, elder law information, and so he agreed to be here next month, and he's going to fill us out some information. So, and Ingrid, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Do you need this back, Cindy? Uh, my name is Ingrid Van Anroy, and I am a physical therapist with Gentiva Home Health Care, and I'm really excited to be here today um, <clears throat> to be talking to you guys about the power of exercise and um, utilizing exercise as medicine for treating Parkinson's uh, disease. Uh, I'm also going to be um, sharing the microphone today with a good friend and colleague, Carolyn Strait, who also works for Gentiva. Uh, she's an occupational therapist and is going to be specifically talking about the LSVT Big program. So. Um, any feedback from the room? I do start to talk fast sometimes, especially when I get excited. So, give me the give me the motion. <clears throat> so, what are the objectives today? What I hope you guys can walk away from uh, this presentation um, t thinking about is why physical therapy and occupational therapy are important. Uh, what you should look for as part of a physical therapy program, specifically. Uh, what specialty programs exist, and what are the benefits of those programs, how to find a physical therapist or occupational therapist in your area, and how can you continue to help the Parkinson's therapy community. <clears throat> so hopefully you guys can all see this picture. I like to start with this because it's a great illustration of just the power of exercise on the brain. I know it probably doesn't mean a whole lot to you unless you're kind of a neuro nerd, I guess, but um, <clears throat> this, okay, this picture is actually taken from um, the Cleveland Clinic cycling study, which I'll be talking about later, and it's showing you um, on the far side here, um, the top and bottom pictures are from the same brain, of a brain po three hours post fo forced exercise, and all these people are doing an upper extremity scanning task, and then the second picture is a um, a brain off medication, and then the last picture is a brain on medication. And I should preface by saying the post-exercise brain is also one that's off medication. Um, and so what you can see in the bottom picture, in the very center, you can see those red, kind of red areas. Those are showing you brain activation while doing this task. And you can see that in the, the pictures on both sides, those activation levels look very similar. So that's the subcortical activation, or the, the part of the brain that's most impacted by Parkinson's disease. And you can see that post-exercise off medication and on medication are very similar. So cool, right? <laughs> I get excited about it because it's a great picture of exercise being a physiological tool that promotes brain health, 
repair, adaptation, and behavioral recovery from the inside. So what's the science behind it? Um, it does help to improve glucose utilization. It improves immune system. It suppresses oxidative stress. It stabilizes calcium homeostasis. It helps to reduce inflammation. It improves mitochondrial function or ATP production. It increases growth and survival factors. And it increases neurotransmitters involved in the emotional, cognitive, and motor systems. So blah, 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 right? <laughs> right, right, no. <clears throat> what you should walk away from that knowing is the bottom line, which is that redundant, healthy, efficient brains have greater recovery, uh, they're more resistant to stress and toxins, and therefore are able to do more with less. So why not just go to the gym, right? We just learned great picture, what exercise can do. I think that's a great idea, but I'm a therapist, so I say why not do both? Why not go to the gym and be involved in therapy so you're able to do both correctly, safely, and well? Um, we just talked about the huge benefits of aerobic exercise. I hope that you've all been, over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of great research on that. I, I hope this isn't the first time you guys are hearing this. Um, I think everyone should exercise five to seven days a week, um, myself included, but especially those that have Parkinson's disease. You just saw all the great, um, that great picture of how it can impact brain function. It can help to promote um, brain and muscle interaction. Your coordination will improve. Um, it can help to turn on attentional and working memory systems. It allows us to complete activities, activities more easily. Um, and it also helps to increase our motor output. It helps prime our bodies to move and to learn. So that's exercise itself. Great power in just that. Um, but as, as a therapist, we are more specifically working on skill acquisition and exercise together. So we might use exercise, especially I might use it, you know, before seeing a patient, I might get them on a cycle and have them start exercising and then participate because their brains are going to be primed to start learning. Um, <clears throat> or as part of exercise, sometimes moving is a cardiovascular workout, so it becomes part of our therapy. Um, <clears throat> So therapy specifically is new skill practice as well. So new skill practice, including things like getting out of a chair, um, on and off the floor. Um, Carrie might say it's cooking, um, learning how to do laundry, um, <clears throat> all those kinds of things, walking as well. Practicing and relearning skills has a huge impact on promoting structural restoration and reorganization of the brain. So that's kind of fancy, sometimes hard to understand. Um, and the analogy that I'll use is, is of a restaurant. So thinking of your brain, don't tell a neurologist <laughs> I'm giving using this analogy, but if you think about your brain as a restaurant, and let's say the cook is sick, is sick so somebody has to cook the food, right? Um, <clears throat> so maybe the hostess steps in and starts making salads. And, um, you know, one of the waiters helps man the grill. Uh, so other parts of the restaurant have to kind of help take over um, what the cook used to do. So that's a very large generalization, but it just kind of helps you um, think about how task practice and learning those skills can you can actually improve. Um, <clears throat> The brain can be restructured and reorganized to accomplish tasks that our other areas now have difficulty with or are unable to do. And this type of practice is where true long-term change occurs and where hopefully with enough practice, the task becomes more automatic. <clears throat> and so along with that, and I kind of mentioned earlier, I think therapy is helpful as well to help find safe activities um, that you can do as well. Um, gyms or starting new activities can be very intimidating, especially if it's something you haven't done your entire life and now you're trying to think about how can I exercise more. Um, I find that few people that attempt without proper guidance have difficulty adhering to a program um, due to increasing pain or injury or they just don't really know what to do. And therapists can help you find activities that you can do safely, but are also challenging, um, because that's also what's important, and we'll be talking about that as well. Um, 
I like this picture too because um, it's <laughs> this kitty looking in the mirror and seeing a lion. And I think it's important to, important to consider that and that we need, um, we need to, good feedback about how we're moving and we need to exercise in a way that's helpful. Um, and I think about it, you know, kind of myself when I'm, when I'm jogging. I'm, I'm definitely a therapy nerd and I'm thinking about how my feet are, feet are hitting the ground the whole time I'm running. And I, in my head, I envision that I have this perfect form and it is just so good. And then Carrie's probably next to me running going, you look terrible, what are you doing? Um, and probably, especially as I get tired, um, my form starts to change. And I think this is especially true with Parkinson's disease because there is a decreased sensory awareness. So oftentimes we think we're taking bigger steps than we actually are. We think we're talking louder than we actually are. And this is where I think therapy can really help. You're getting accurate feedback about what you're actually doing. So you're not like this kitty looking in the mirror seeing this lion. And lastly, I do think a therapist with a lot of um, experience and knowledge in treating Parkinson's patients uh, can be a great tool to educate and empower you. Um, we know there's changes in the healthcare system. It's challenging as a therapist, and I can only imagine as a doctor and the amount of time that they actually get to spend with you providing education. And I think this is where a therapist gets a little bit more time and has that opportunity to provide more education um, and information about how exercise can help. <clears throat> okay, so what do you need to think about when you um, are starting a therapy program? What are the components that are required? Um, and I'm going to touch base on five. These are kind of, th this isn't specific to me. This is specific to the principles of what I call neuroplastic change. So when we're talking about that brain change, um, these are the tools. And every therapist should be familiar with these. They, they aren't rocket science. We are taught these things. Um, <clears throat> but I specifically want to stress that because I know I'm speaking not only to people in Spokane, but kind of around the Northwest. And there aren't specific specialty programs everywhere. And it's not the end all be all. There are other things you can look for as part of a therapy program. So the therapy program needs to be intense. It needs to be difficult and complex. It needs to be specific. It needs to be salient, salient or provide emotional engagement. And lastly, it needs to be repetitive. <clears throat> so we'll be talking a little more in depth on each of these. So the first part I mentioned was intensity. How hard do you have to work, right? Um, <clears throat> well, I'm going to talk about this great study done over at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, but it definitely needs to be um, beyond a self-selected speed. I can tell you that. So just you walking your usual speed, um, probably not enough. Um, what, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Cleveland Clinic study. It's really cool. You should go look it up if you aren't. But basically what happened is, um, uh, I'm kind of giving you, give, give you the short version of it. Um, a neurologist, and anyone from the Midwest knows about RAGBRAI. It's a big bike race across the state of Iowa. And this neurologist happened one day, I don't know if the partner was sick or what, happened to be on the front of a tandem cycle with an individual with Parkinson's disease on the back. So they started cycling at a much faster rate than this patient or this individual was used to. Um, and sh after this, I don't know how far they go, 30 to 60 miles maybe a day, um, after she got off the cycle, she noticed significant change in her motor symptoms. Upper extremity tremor was a lot less. Um, she could actually write significantly better. So from that, they have started this study. And Jay Albert is the guy that's been doing it, if you want to look it up. Um, but what I would suggest is that in these studies, they're suggesting that you need to work 20% harder than a self-selected speed for to see a difference. So consider that when exercising. Um, I mean, I think there are some big central effects that I'm not really touching on here, but um, there's definitely benefits. They've actually even created, I think it's called the Sarah cycle, and there's a picture on your screen from this. And it's not passive movement, so I don't want you to walk away saying, if I just put my feet on this cycle and let it do all the work, I'm going to get better. No, you didn't hear me say that. Um, these individuals are actively doing it, but this machine is making them go faster than they normally could. Okay. And secondly, it needs to be um, difficult or complex. So you need to have a very constant high attentional focus. So I think about you know just walking on a treadmill again. If it's a very slow speed, you don't really have to pay attention. I would suggest it's probably not enough. You need to be engaged in the activity. 
And let me see if I can get my video to work here. Do I have to go out of this, Carrie? Oh, here we go. There you go. She just had a connection on there, but maybe it doesn't work. We're not switching screens yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. This is not my gift, technical <laughs> stuff. No, why is Won't it work? Doing okay, that's okay. No, I think it should be on that. If it's we your, it should turn it? into a hand, is what it is. Yeah, here, go ahead and escape and it'll be. Bear with us. Do you want to see me do this very exciting exercise? It's a small video. I'm going to kind of talk you through it. This is me. Um, <clears throat> starting with a very s sort of simple task. I'm just doing a step up here on a box step. <clears throat> and then I start to, that seems pretty easy, so I'm going to add a little bit of complexity to it. So I'm going to start to add a little rotation with it, turning in a circle. <laughs> And then I'm going to add a scarf toss, and I'm not super great at that, you can see. <clears throat> and then, I don't know if you'll be able to hear this, and then I start counting backwards by threes as I do it, and I just start to fall apart. I don't even think I can count correctly. I think I almost fall coming up. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> So basically, the idea behind that is the exercise or therapy that you do, it needs to be challenging. So if you're continuously doing the same thing and you don't have to focus on it, it's probably not hard enough. And I would probably, you know, at the end there, if somebody was doing that and fell apart like I did, I'd probably back it off and we would make it a little bit easier. Sorry, Ingrid. Okay. Uh, you there just go. go back to start. So third concept is it needs to be specific, use it or lose it, very true. Um, I have most patients tell me that they can no longer get off the floor anymore, and I asked them the last time they tried, and they say, I don't know, it's been 20 years. And I'm like, well, <laughs> you, if, you don't, if you don't do it, yes, you probably can't do it any longer. So the task does need to be specific to what you want to accomplish. If you want to be better at doing stairs, you know, if you just do seated balance, are you going to get better? Probably not. You need to do stairs. Um, it's also true that it becomes more challenging, I find, with individuals with Parkinson's to generalize a task. So if they want to be able to get off a chair and all we practice from is a very standard chair, they might be awesome at that. But when they go to sit in their rock or recliner, they fall apart. They just can't do it. So it needs to be able, you need to be, you need to practice getting in and out of that hard chair. So it needs to be specific to you and what your goals are. The fourth piece is it needs to have, there needs to be some emotional engagement involved. So it needs to help drive those internal motivational circuits. Um, and what I mean by that is um, a lot of times, like, I'll use video. So I'll um, video someone at either the start of our therapy or on evaluation and video them again at the end of the session. Because it's hard, like I said, for, for individuals with Parkinson's disease sometimes to get that sensory awareness of how they're doing. So if you can see it on video, you can see, oh, wow, I did make a difference. It's rewarding. Um, <clears throat> and educate them. I'll also use a lot of objective tests um, to sh so that um, an individual's able to see their progress. Um, you know, social reinforcement helps other people involved. Um, and it needs to be functional. It needs to be something um, that, you know, is valuable to you. If you want to be able to walk a mile, you know, work on that. That It needs to be something that you want to be able to do. And repetition. I hope Carrie can give you a lot of knowledge about this. <laughs> this is kind of the age-old question, how often is enough? <clears throat> I would say that we don't quite know yet. Um, is once a week enough, though? I would say probably not. Um, you know, I think I have two little boys at home, and I think about how long it took them to learn to walk. Um, you know, we're dealing with that kind of neurocircuitry as well uh, 
quite a while, actually. They had to practice lots and lots of times. So how often is enough? I don't know, but I always tell my patients to practice as often as feasibly possible. Um, usually the more you do it correctly, um, the better. And that's something to think about, too, is that the motion needs to be done correctly. Um, and you can see in this picture here, I've got a little a lady. I think, actually, she's doing part of the big program. Maybe. Maybe Carrie can give me. Um, you can see her arm's not quite as high as that therapist wants her arm to be. Um, but she's working with someone who's helping her do it repetitively and trying to do it correctly each time. <clears throat> so those are the, the five real principles of neuroplasticity, so brain change as part of a therapy program. And I do want you guys to keep those in mind when looking for a therapist because, you know, that's especially if you don't have specialty programs available to you, um, that's just something to consider when, you find it, when you're looking for a therapist and what your program's going to look like. So there are numerous uh, programs nationally um, for Parkinson's disease. Uh, Carrie and I ha are familiar with these four that I'm going to talk briefly about. We will go a little more into depth in, on the Parkinson's Wellness Recovery and the LSVT Big Program. Um, but there, I'm sure that there's lots more. You guys might ask me, and I might say, I don't know. Um, these are the ones that I'm pretty familiar with. Um, so like I mentioned, the Parkinson's Wellness Recovery, which I'll call power, which is not correlated with the power of Parkinson's Power Summit. Um, and then LSVT Big, which Carrie will be talking specifically about. And then there's also, um, it's called the Sensory Motor Agility Training Program. It was developed over at OHSU uh, by Lori King and Faye Horak. So you might have some therapists that actually think there's a sensory motor uh, exercise class here um, or agility class here. Um, and they basically take six different components of exercise like Tai Chi, Pilates, boxing, and combine it into an hour of therapy. And then also there's a program called Allied Team Training for Parkinson's Disease, uh, which is a program done by the National Parkinson's Foundation. And it's more of a general um, overview as far as getting therapists, nurses to work together and giving you the most, ev giving the therapist the most evidence-based practice, current practice for treating Parkinson's disease. So um, what I've been certified in and when I'm, when a, pro a program I'm very excited about is called the Parkinson's Wellness Recovery, or POWER. Um, this program was developed by Becky Farley, who, is one, who was one of the creators of the LSVT Big program. Uh, she lives down in Tucson, Arizona. And I'll be giving you the website in a little bit, but she has this cool website about her. She has a therapy gym and a clinic. Um, or a gym and a therapy clinic, I should say, where she offers gym memberships and, and continued exercise classes along with therapy. So she's working with exercise trainers and this really cool concept kind of concept. She was in research for a very long time and decided she really wanted to put those tools to practice. And so that's what she does. Um, she also offers lots of training to therapists and exercise trainers um, and is trying to kind of market her gym and kind of send that around the nation, which is really cool. So if you go to her website or look up Power YouTube, there's a great 10-minute video that kind of gives you a synopsis. Um, it's a little too long to play today, but very cool. Um, OK, this is where I need to switch, Tim. So I'm going to be showing you guys in a second just a little YouTube video. This wasn't done by Becky, but this was a, two other therapists from Minnesota. It's just a quick... <coughs> it's a quick little... Um, it's showing... They'll kind of talk you through it, but it's showing a um, fairly high-level veterinarian who's starting a power program and kind of the complexity they add to it. Um, the nice thing about the power program is it can be, if you can only sit, you can do it seated, you can do it lying down. Um, the concepts can be um, correlated, so you don't have to be able to stand up and walk to do it, um, which is nice. <laughs> Uh, they're basically talking, they have a veterinarian who has a tremor, an upper extremity tremor, and this is the program that they've developed for her specifically. Yeah. 
wanted to decrease left arm stiffness to improve function. This just kind of gives you an idea. She looks really good, doesn't she? This is very high level. Um, so there's also, but I said, said there are actual seated options as well as um, floor options or being on your back options. So I realize this is this is what I had to work with. So. Carrie, Carolyn Strait, occupational therapist, and she's going to give you guys some information about LSVT Big. Thanks. Yeah, we're quick friends, so you can call me Carrie, not Carolyn. But um, I am LSVT Big certified. I got certified actually in October of last year, so I am not even a year into this, but I use it with my Parkinson's patients. We actually get a lot of referrals from neurologists for home health. Um, for those clients that are homebound. So um, I did do some research in the Spokane area. Right now, LSVT Big, which is the physical therapy and occupational therapy portion of LSVT, which I'll talk about, um, is available um, in outpatient clinics and in home health. And, and there's a lot of interest and a lot of buzz in our community right now around this program. So we're hoping that it's gonna be more available to folks with Parkinson's, but right now, um, We'll, we'll talk more towards the end about how you can find a clinician if this, if this is a program that is interesting to you. So as you can see, the LSVT stands for Lee Silverman Voice Treatment. So this program started out of the LSVT Loud, which is the speech therapy uh, program that's available and has been around since 1987. It's been around a long time. Um, Lee Silverman is actually a woman with Parkinson's. She was a patient, and um, there's a comment in the training and her family just saying, if only we could hear her and understand her. And they were so frustrated by her the, the impairment in um, their mom's speech because of her Parkinson's disease, and they developed this very intensive program geared towards speech and her vocal intensity, how loud she could talk, how clearly she could talk, and the results and the outcomes were astounding. And they said, well, we can get somebody to be loud, why can't we get them to be big? And so they created a program for physical and occupational therapists um, to treat Parkinson's disease. So the LSVT Big is an intensive, like you've heard um, over and over from Ingrid, and that is so important because we are trying to change your brain and we are trying to slow the disease progression and uh, make an impact on your quality of life. And it's focused on the limb-based motor system, so your arms, your legs, your trunk, um, working on how you're moving. And the LSVT Big Program, uh, the techniques that you learn, the exercises you learn, 
are aimed specifically at addressing the slowness, so the bradykinesia you experience with Parkinson's disease, um, the freezing that you might experience with your Parkinson's disease, and then, um, like Ingrid's also mentioned, that sensory awareness. So um, it always surprises me uh, a lot of spouses and caregivers out there with their their person with Parkinson's that they're involved with, well, they're just, they're not picking up their feet. I tell them to pick up their feet and they're just shuffling their feet all the time when they're walking. And that person with Parkinson's is not intentionally, it's almost like they think they're intentionally doing that. They're not. They don't have an awareness that they're walking like that. And until you use videotaping or use some of the strategies, um, that person often is not able to correct that on their own, and sometimes the, finding the right cues is really um, important and finding the right activities to address that specifically. So that sensory deficit, that awareness deficit is there with Parkinson's disease. So when we're cueing for um, high amplitude movement, it doesn't mean that when you go through LSVT big, we're teaching you to move too big. And, and like you saw in the video with the power, those exercises are amazing. But it's not like when you go to reach on the top of the fridge, you're going to be doing this every time. But when you go to reach, you will get to the top of the fridge instead of the slow small movements that you typically see when you go to reach for something. So by that repetition and that intensity of the exercise and the movements that you're doing should carry over into your functional day-to-day -day activities that you're trying to accomplish. So we want you to feel big when you're working with us. Um, so, so it is important that we take you to your limits of range of motion, but you have to feel big in order to move normally. Um, with Parkinson's disease, because on your own, um, folks with Parkinson's feel like they are moving normally. They don't feel like they're moving too small. So, so we have to change that, um, change that perception. So the target. This is what I love about LSVT. It's very simple for clinicians. So for OTs and PTs, all we're focusing on is you being big, and you will hear big, 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 big. <laughs> for a full month <laughs> and you will be tired of hearing big but you will feel so good because you will start to be big and um, so we're focusing purely the target of our treatment is on your amplitude the mode like Ingrid's talk talked about again is high intensity high effort so again we're not going to let you just go and walk um, to the fridge uh, and get back to your recliner, and that's an, that was a nice walk, good therapy session. No, we're going to do it over and over, and then we're going to add challenges, and we're going to add complexity. We're going to make you reach um, places that you didn't think you should be reaching or, or um, typically wouldn't. Um, and the third fundamental is calibration, and that comes back to that neuroplasticity that Ingrid was talking about. We are trying to reprogram your brain. We're trying to use exercise, and we're trying to use our activities and our therapy sessions to reprogram your brain and to recalibrate how you are moving. So um, you feel, so that sensory tab, you feel normal movement. You internally know what normal movement and how big you're supposed to be moving. You know what that is because you have, because of the repetition and going through the program, you are able to internally cue yourself on that. And then you just feel better because you're doing the things you want to do during your day. You are no longer um, seeing some of your motor symptoms with Parkinson's disease as a barrier to being able to participate in your day-to-day -day life. So, um, more importantly, those neuropsychological changes are, are the thing that make me really excited when working with patients because they are excited about what they're able to do. This is just a graph just to show um, the calibration and what it really is for, for folks with Parkinson's. So in the, pur the purple, the middle line, that's normal. That's, um, you know, how I might walk down the street. I'm, I'm supposedly normal. And uh, with Parkinson's disease, the green line, you can see movement becomes much smaller and slower than normal. So when you're going through LSVT, um, you're for that full hour of therapy, and then I'll talk more about this later, then a second session later on in the day outside of your therapy, you are doing exercises, you are doing functional tasks that bring you up to that level of the yellow line where you are moving bigger than normal in, during that full hour in order to um, 
bring your green Parkinson's line up into that purple area in your normal, uh, in your everyday uh, movements. So the delivery and the care delivery, what it looks like if you if you uh, go to see an LSVT big certified clinician is you will have one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions. This is not in a group. It's one-on-one -on -one with your PT and OT. The program is very individualized to you. Um, it is four consecutive days per week for four weeks. Anybody doing that much therapy for that long is going to get better. So why LSVT big? Um, because the 16 sessions are, it's a specific protocol. So you, for the, those six, excuse me, four weeks, will be doing the same seven exercises. And then we add in functional tasks based on what you find your deficits are in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, one of those is always going to be a sit to stand practice. Like you saw in the video that Ingrid showed um, with the veterinarian with the medicine ball. And, and she was standing on foam. Did you guys catch that? The blue foam mat. Highly, highly complex task, high, high balance challenge. So, you know, the same thing with LSVT Big is you're increasing that challenge so that when you get off of your comfy, um, cushy couch or you get off of your stool in the shower or you get off of the toilet or whatever, your car, get in and out of your car, that no longer becomes a challenging, daunting task for you. You're, you're able to get up from all of those surfaces. But they are one hour sessions, there are no junk minutes. We don't let you rest very well. <laughs> We're not good at that. But uh, we do not want to um, turn you off from the program. So, you know, uh, over that four weeks, it's continually getting um, harder. Uh, we're using those 60 minutes for the full benefit of, of getting you where you want to be with your disease process. Um, there are daily care carryover assignments, so we, we try and leave you with um, activities that you need to practice. So what we work on in our therapy sessions are things that you're working on for that entire day, and then we come back the next day. How did things go? How did you feel? What was the feedback? Did anybody say anything about how big you were wo moving? Um, and and there, that daily homework, sorry, going to, down to the last one again, we're giving you um, ideas of things that you can continue to work on out th outside of our therapy sessions. I can tell the patients that I work with that don't do that second set of exercises during um, our time together, and they still get better. There's still benefit. Um, like I said, if you, and like Ingrid has said, it's not the end all be all for therapy, but um, if you can get into an intensive program and you can buy into doing some physical or occupational therapy, um, you can get better. Uh, it's not a death sentence. There's always hope <laughs> and there's always something. Uh, we like to be bossy and tell you what to do and we're really good at it. <laughs> So hopefully we find the right things to tell you to do so that you, you get some buy-in as well because um, it does make a difference. And then like I really love this quote. The mantra really is don't practice until you get it right. Practice until you can't get it wrong. So that repetition and that intensity is really important. Um, you might feel like, gosh, we're doing these exercises every day, two days, a, you know, for two times a day. That You know, do I? It, it's daunting, but... Um, the outcomes are pretty incredible. So I do have a video as well. Hopefully mine will work too. <laughs> There's no sound on this. Um, this is basically, you can find this on YouTube, but this is Bernie. Uh, this is a patient with Parkinson's, was referred for LSVT big. On the left, you can see is Bernie pre-LSVT walking with his cane. They, he's walking the same distance in this video over the same amount of time. They've just put them side by side. Um, you can see Bernie over the carpet thresholds, surface changes, um, become very challenging at times for folks with Parkinson's. Uh, and then on the right, Bernie's already out in the parking lot. <laughs> Bernie just blew right over those, those um, rugs in the entryway there. So... Bernie's just come down the stairs on the left and is approaching his car. He's already done a full loop in the parking lot on the right. So you can see, too, the arm swing. He's no longer using his cane. Uh, just as a side, he was referred because he was falling one to two times a week. Um, Bernie had, was having no falls by the end of his program and doing the full month with the, the physical or occupational therapist.
endurance wise because you're working an hour a day four times a day uh, four times a week <laughs> for four weeks you can imagine the effect it has on your activity tolerance your you know all of your cardiopulmonary system so not only are you learning to move big but all of the benefits of exercise like Ingrid has has so eloquently explained um, are there with this program as well so uh, it's pretty exciting, and I, I'm, I'm excited for more opportunity in our community and, and in our surrounding communities for this to become available for people. So I'll let Ingrid take it over, but that, that is a, in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Does everyone want to sign up now? <laughs> everyone looks tired. Oh, Cindy does. <laughs> it is pretty daunting, like Carrie said, but it is the outcomes are very, very cool. Um, <clears throat> so I want to um, finish up with talking about... Um, how to find a clinician, um, because I'm sure that's what you guys all are thinking. I want to go see Carrie. I do too, so you have to get in line. Um, <clears throat> no, but um, I think it's important to know the information that therapists have. Um, just like when choosing a doctor, you need to be informed about who you're choosing as a therapist. Um, so this is a typo, but where has Parkinson's come over the past 50 years? Um, so thinking about in the 1960s, uh, levodopa was introduced. And in the 1970s, you know, drugs started to improve. Um, they were saying exercise, oh, that's not helpful at all. Um, and in the 1980s, they were saying exercise, oh, it's a, you should try that. Um, 1990s, deep brain stimulation uh, was added. 2000s, um, using exercise as a, as a complement with medications. And just in the last 10 years, lots of <coughs> awesome research is going on. Uh, looking at exercise and disease modification in animal models, looking at exercise and brain reorganization in human models, um, find, looking at biomarkers for earlier detection, um, is there neuro, is neuroprotection going on? Um, so you can just see all the change, and you can imagine if you graduated from PT school in 1970, um, you know, hopefully you've done some con con continuing education since then, um, but you can see what that might look like from a therapist's perspective. Um, <clears throat> When we all get out of school, we're all generalists. Um, we can practice anywhere. We can practice in pediatrics. We can practice in, um, you know, with geriatrics. We can practice with treating Parkinson's patients. And it's really up to the clinician. I hope that all therapists do their continuing education. We're required to do so much every, um, in this state, uh, 40 hours every two years. Um, but everyone decides what they're interested in. So um, you might see a therapist who's done a lot of, um, had a lot of experience with Parkinson's and done a lot of research and knows the latest research. And unfortunately, you might see somebody that hasn't. Um, so that's important to consider. <clears throat> so how do we find a clinician? Um, <clears throat> I will say I have researched these websites and it's hard. I kind of, it's challenging. Um, the, webs the websites you can look at as far as the POWER program is www.powerforlife.org, um, and you can go and find clinicians. Um, but I'll even say myself, I've changed jobs in the last six months, and I'm on there, but it's my old job. So um, I'll, you, you can also go to the LSVT Global website um, and find clinicians for that. Um, the National Parkinson's Foundation um, does have a list, although that's much more confusing, harder to navigate, I thought. So my best advice, you can try them out, you can look. Um, you can also ask other individuals with Parkinson's who they've seen. Um, you can ask PTs, OTs. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about next. <clears throat> So how do you find one? Um, I definitely recommend you ask. You know, if you're now, I'm talking specifically about you know treating your motor symptoms. So if you know it's specifically you had rotator cuff surgery, you know, it might look a little different. So, <clears throat> um, but ask the therapist if they've had any specialized training. Um, how many individuals with Parkinson's do they treat a year? Um, I think that's valuable. If I'm going to have my knee replaced, you know I'm going to ask that surgeon, how many right knees or how many knees do you replace a year? I'm not going to go see someone that's only done one a year. <clears throat> um, and also be specific about your issues or goals. Um, and you guys should have a handout in here, and then I think there's an electronic one that Cindy has sent. Um, this is a great handout, and it was created by Lisa Mann. She's a nurse over at OHSU. Um, it's specifically for when you're going to see a doctor. But I think it's important to consider before you see a therapist as well. Um, what are your issues primarily? Um, what are your goals? 
Uh, when did the problem start? What makes the problem better or worse? Be specific about on and off times. You know, if I evaluate a patient and they're doing great, they're on, and I say, wow, you're doing really well. And then the next time I, you know, I say, well, watch, I don't know if you need a whole lot of therapy. And they don't tell me about their on and off times, or I don't ask. Um, and then I see them the next time, and they're off, and it's like, gosh, what's going on? Um, so I just think that's important to keep in mind when you go see a therapist. They might want to see you when you're off and how you're doing and what you need help with then. Maybe when, you know, your drugs are working fine, you're doing really well. Um, and then when you find a therapist, be consistent and committed to them. That's the biggest thing. It's really hard, like Carrie said, you know, she's seen patients in that setting quite a lot. But if a patient's not buying in, I mean, it is hard to make a lot of progress. <laughs> so how do you maintain your goals? You've done this, you know, big program or you've done a great therapy program and, um, you know, you've met your current goals. How are you going to maintain those goals? Continue your exercise program. Hopefully you've developed an exercise program with your therapist that means something to you and you want to do, and you sort of like to do it. <laughs> I realize it's exercise and not everyone loves it, but it should be something that you sort of enjoy. It's sort of functional. Um, <clears throat> make exercise a part of your day. If you're going to get out of a chair, do it repetitively. It doesn't always have to be at one chunk at the end of your day. I think sometimes we get in that mindset that if I can't do an hour of exercise today, I'm not going to do it, you know. Do 10 minutes here. Do 10 minutes there. Just make it a part of your everyday life. Find a workout partner. Um, find a community exercise class that fits your exercise needs. Um, ask your therapist for suggestions. Um, and this is a part. This is a place I'm going to talk a little bit more about. Um, an area I'm really excited about. Um, just community wellness. Find those activities in your community um, that you can get involved in. There's been a big push over the last years, you heard me talking with the power program, where they're actually educating exercise trainers and um, helping them be involved so that we're not seeing this big drop off when someone comes off therapy services that they're able to continue to exercise. Um, lots of new options popping up, you guys might know more. Um, ones that I've found and are sort of familiar with, delay the disease, uh, pull walking groups, pedaling for Parkinson's, uh, dance for PD, uh, there's agility classes, uh, like I mentioned, there's power gyms, um, other Parkinson's disease community wellness programs. Be an advocate for these programs. We need your help. Um, we need to get these in our areas for sure. Um, also be an advocate for therapy. You know your body best. You know, we have some great neurologists and doctors in our area, but, you know, if when you start having falls, sometimes they refer you. We want it to be sooner than that. Um, if you're starting to notice a change, ask for a referral. Um, <coughs> encourage specialty classes to your clinicians, especially if you're in an area where there's not, you don't have a lot of options. Um, inform them. Sometimes they don't know. Um, tell them about the big program. Tell them about the power program. You know, encourage them to go. Encourage your exercise trainers to go as well. Um, <clears throat> help bring continuing education classes to our community. Um, like I mentioned with the power program or even the big program, I believe with the big program, I know with the power program you can host a site. So host a site in your area. Get all those therapists trained so that everyone's on the same page. Bring exercise trainers in. Um, Delay the Disease offers training to exercise trainers. Um, LA Team Training helps train the whole team as a whole. I'm talking fast because I'm getting really excited. Um, <clears throat> just because I think that there is so much hope. Um, there's been so much research uh, that the future is so bright um, with Parkinson's disease. Um, there's lots of new research supporting the power of exercise and therapy to decrease motor symptoms and improve mood. Um, <clears throat> there are more specialty programs becoming available. And there's a large movement to work more closely with our community, including exercise trainers, so that we're all working together. <clears throat> so I leave you with this, your exercise prescription for the day. <clears throat> so take notes, everybody. Just kidding. Um, now, I didn't mention meds much today, but I, I don't want you to walk away and go tell your neurologist that Ingrid said I don't need to take my meds, just exercise. That's not what I said. I will never say that. Um, I like patients to have their meds optimized before they come and start therapy. Um, therapy and meds together are truly the best medicine at this point. Um, and help your doctors help track your on and off periods. That's going to help them um, properly adjust your medications. 
Um, regularly exercise without breaks, which may slow disease progression. So I don't mean exercise all day, every day. I mean regularly exercise consistently across the course of a year. Don't do it for a day and then don't do it for a week. Rex exercise regularly. Um, and think of exercise just like taking your daily medications. It's medicine. You need to do it every day. Do something harder and bigger than you think you need to every single day. Um, advocate for a referral to therapy services before your symptoms are too far progressed. Um, find a cl clinician that meets your needs um, and, you and continue to work with them. Stick with them and stay in contact with them. Check in. Um, <clears throat> If able, stay active in community exercise and enrichment programs. Those social interactions help keep you consistent and boost your mood. And set goals and consistently work towards them. It helps you stay focused and makes recognizing those accomplishments um, much easier. So if you have a goal, you're not saying, oh, I don't know, I feel a little better. But have a specific goal and you will see change. And then lastly, everybody feels better. When you do something for others, eat well and laugh a lot. So, what questions do you guys have? I guess Cindy will open it. Okay. Let's see. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, let's uh, start by going around to our sites and see if we have questions. Um, uh, remember to uh, unmute your mic on your phone. Let me know how many uh, are attending at your site today, and then let go ahead and ask questions. Um, and if they're specific to Carrie or Ingrid, you can let us know that, or we'll just try and figure it out as we go. Uh, Anchorage, Alaska. And if we go, okay. hi there, Ingrid. Okay, if, we, if we go through and I miss you or something, just let something. me know. She says she normally prescribes uh, 100 units or 1,000 units of this vitamin D. I get minus 2,000, what she prescribed a day. Hello? Is that Anchorage? That was Pam's then, I think. This is Anchorage. Okay. Anchorage, how many? people do you have today? Uh, it's like five. Five, and did you have any questions? I do. Uh, if a person takes one of these uh, intensive classes, how long does the effect last if they don't continue with their uh, work? Um, maybe Carrie has some other insight. I would say um, Carrie can maybe specifically talk about LSBT big patients. Um, you know, it depends how much you continue to do it, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> There is some uh, research with LSVT. Um, they're very uh, patented. It's actually an international program, so there's a lot of money and backing for this program. But the research with um, Parkinson's disease shows that somebody that goes through the program, the effects, the improvements compared to just traditional therapy uh, last as much as three months after the program. I often recommend to my clients that I work with that I like to see them um, in another six months at the very latest. It would be nice for them to try and get a referral back to me. It's hard in home health because a lot changes, so tricky on my end, but the research is showing that the effects can last up to three months. <clears throat> Thank you, great presentation. Thank you very much, Anchorage. Uh, Billings, Montana. Yes, we have two in attendance, and I just wanted to put a word in, we have three Parkinson's dance classes going on in Billings now and having marvelous results and having a ball doing it too. Yay, congratulations. Thank you. That's great to have three. That beats us here in Spokane. You guys are forward thinking. Chewila, Providence St. Joseph's. Clarkston. Tri-State Memorial. We have three questions. Uh, during the first few minutes of the presentation, she used two terms, oxalative stress and redundant brains. Please explain these two terms. Well, I will do my best. 
Um, redundant brain, I would say, is typically within our system, we have um, numerous avenues throughout our brain uh, to kind of create the same, do the same task. So that's what I mean by a redundant brain. If you have a redundant brain, you don't have one area where if you're having difficulty there doing it, you can, you can kind of find other avenues to complete that same task. Um, oxidative stress, uh, you know, decrease oxygenation, best of my ability. <laughs> Fancy science words. Does that help? You need to unmute your mic, uh, Carson. Do I have it on now? There we go. Yes. Okay, pole walking. What is pole walking? Um, so pole walking is, I don't know if you're familiar with Nordic walking, uh, using trekking poles basically. Yeah. They sell different kinds of trekking poles out in the community. Um, Becky Farley down in Tucson, she does a lot of it um, because it helps to engage your whole body system, really works on balance, coordination. Um, it's a good social activity. Um, so there's some pole walking groups, basically walking with poles. So it's kind of like ski poles. Ski poles, yeah. Think about ski poles, I guess. <laughs> Again, you need to unmute your mic, Clarkston. How's that? There you are. Okay. The sessions that are four days a week for four weeks, how long do the sessions last? In reference to the LSVT big, they're 60 minute sessions, so full hour. It's a full time job. <laughs> Thank you, Clark. Excuse me. I yeah, I didn't have, tell can you tell me how many you have today? I apologize, I missed that. Or you can come back on later. Um, Got it. It was four, 14, 14. Thank you. And were you okay? Were you done with the questions? That was three. Did you have any more? Okay. We're going to. Move to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Yes, we have uh, eight people today. Any questions? No questions. Thank you, Coeur d'Alene. Uh, Colville, Providence, Mount Carmel. Dayton General Hospital. Miles City, Montana. Yes, this is Miles City, and we have nine smiling souls. Yay. Thank you, Miles. <laughs> and no questions. No questions today. Thank you very much for attending today. Thank you. Uh, Pendleton, Oregon. Port Townsend, Jefferson Healthcare. Pullman Regional Hospital. We have two and one question. Two and one question. Yeah. Uh, can you Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Are you yeah. listening? No, I think they're done. Bonnie, we're having a little bit harder time hearing you. Can you do this non big amount of function via tele uh, <laughs> telehealth? Hello? Bonnie, I might need you to email your question and pass it on to Ingrid and Carrie because we have some background noise too. I apologize. Can you email me? Yeah. And it, email me at center at spokaneparkinsons.org. And we'll get your question answered, okay? Thank you, Bonnie. Okay, um, to Nasket, North Valley. Hi, this was a great presentation, one of the best. 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Is this okay. Tim? There's. Yeah. Um, two people and no questions. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming today. Uh, Walla Walla. Walla Walla has two people and at least one question. Okay. Question go ahead. has to do. Question has to do with sexual performance and Parkinson's. I noticed there are several men at these gatherings, and I seem to be losing ability to have strong sex. I'm wondering if the exercise would be helpful in that. I honestly, I honestly don't know the answer. I can't. Well, I'm hurt. wondering if someone, <laughs> I'm wondering if someone would be willing to do some research in that area. I'm sure that, that's needed for sure. Okay. I think you, so. Do you have um, access to email? Yes. Can you email me that question at center at spokaneparkinsons.org? Sure. And we will see if we can find some information about that and exercise um, and get back to you. That's what we do. What was Thank you. Sherry, did you have a question? That's no other question. Okay. But please email me and we'll see what we can do to help answer that question. Did we miss any sites? Yes, Moses Lake. Oh, Moses Lake, thank you. How many we have people? eight. Okay. Eight. And we were wondering if you knew if there were any physical therapists in Moses Lake that can do the uh, LSVT big. Uh, the best thing to recommend would just be to go on to the www.lsvtglobal.com website, mm -hmm. and there is a tag that it cues you to find a clinician. Um, I've only done a search within a 50-mile radius. Well, yeah, that's you're outside of what it, the search right. I've personally done. So um, they, they, if there is anybody, they yeah. would be on that website. How long does it take for them to train? It is actually a weekend course. So that would oh. be a wonderful thing to do in the Moses Lake area and start certifying uh -huh. some clinicians up there, over there. Uh -huh. Thank you. Or if we get enough requests to our board of directors that we'd like to have one of the types of training here in the Spokane area, we can bring people in from around and uh, get some people trained on a weekend would be fabulous. We just need requests. So. Okay. <laughs> um, Thank Spokane. you. Thank you. Cindy, Spokane has 27, and we do have questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one remark and one or two questions. The uh, gentleman who called in, I think from Miles City, may be in need of female, not email. And first question is. Party. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the blush. We love that. <laughs> uh, first question is uh, what does this cost? Second question is who pays for it? But it's what cost? The, the program itself? Okay. The uh, 16 uh, program. The LSBT, okay. Yeah. I do it in home health therapy. So for my clients, typically I'm seeing folks under Medicare benefit. Medicare covers home health at 100%. Um, if you are seeing an outpatient, clinician, then it is typically a uh, copay of some sort, uh, depending on insurance. Do you yeah, know the typically, typically, uh, my experience with Medicare as far as therapy um, is you're required to pay 20% unless you have a secondary that covers that 20%. So it just kind of mm -hmm. depends on what CPT codes the clinician bills um, to Medicare. Um, and there is a, actually, I don't know at this point um, with the modifiers, I, I don't do outpatient either, um, but there was a cap limit for a little while. I think that's currently, it's every year it changes if there's a cap or no cap, but I think right now you're okay. And especially if you have certain diseases like Parkinson's disease, usually helps cover you with that. <clears throat> and okay. I, I will add, don't, 
don't wait till you're homebound to do it <laughs> um, to get that 100% coverage. It definitely is worth the cost if it's something you're considering. Um, and the outpatient clinics could be should be able to answer that question for you specifically. I know in uh, Spokane, North Spokane, at Apex Physical Therapy, off of Nevada, Megan Lust is a LSVT Big Certified Physical Therapist doing this program. Um, and I'm sure the clinic there would be able to answer those questions. Cindy's writing it down. So hopefully you guys get that information in the Spokane area. Okay, and we have another question here. On the video about Bernie, is was that a uh, very, uh, what is my word? Sorry, lost my words. Recent video, he was diagnosed, I saw in 95, and was the video in the, like the last year or so? Uh, no, that was after his initial introduction to LSVT, so it was likely, I don't have the information on when oh. the video was, but whenever he went through the program, it, it yeah. Okay, so now I'm he, not answering like that. he would be 10 years advanced. Mm -hmm. It would be great to have a follow-up video on Bernie, oh, okay. see how he's doing, but yeah, I think they're just doing a, um, <laughs> trying to give an introduction of the impact of the program. Um, it, it was tremendous. Yes, yeah, it is. And it is. Um, the earlier, the better. We try and tell people, you know, even right after diagnosis, get into an activity program or a therapy program of some sort to get those habits in place. It does not have to be LSVT to get those outcomes. But if you can get get some good motor habits in place, the earlier, the better. Um, I want to comment, too, on early, um, you know, initial diagnosis. I, I think that um, you know, as a Parkinson's community, we need to encourage those, if you hear of anyone that's been newly diagnosed, to get therapy early, um, mm -hmm. even if they don't notice a whole lot of motor symptoms, usually it's something small, even if it's initial one or two sessions, to educate them about, you know, you know, the disease process, how exercise can help, finding exercise programs in their community that can be challenging to them, so. And did, I missed the very first part, are you both local here in Spokane? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we both do home health, unfortunately. I understand. Thank you. So after finishing the LSVT program, uh, how often does the patient need to do the follow-ups? Like every two years, every year? You know, you mentioned about the trainers in the gym, you know, to help person carry on that level of activity. But as far as LSVT component is concerned, you said there is a three-month carryover. So I'm just wondering as to how often they need the retuning or therapy sessions. That's a great question. Um, I, I usually say six months at the earliest. Um, some people will, because I've, I haven't even been doing this a year, I haven't had a lot of follow-ups personally. I know that the um, experts that I mm -hmm. was trained from, they um, work at Parkinson's clinics, uh, and they recommend that their clients come in every six months for a reevaluation. And at that point, they can either recommend uh, going through the program again or um, fine-tuning their exercises and then sending them on their way. So it's not a cut-and-dry answer. Uh, certainly, when you follow up with your neurologist, um, if you're noticing any declines or changes in your motor symptoms, then um, it, it might prompt some kind of a referral. But typically, I'm, I'm recommending a six-month follow-up, even if it's uh, just a face-to-face -face with the neurologist. Also, too, does this LSVT program work with other conditions, like people who have had stroke or any of that yeah, population? that's a great question. They are doing some research, and even the atypical Parkinson's, um, processes out there there is they do show benefit with those but the research is primarily with patients with Parkinson's so um, we do uh, the your LSVT clinician can do some stimulability testing which is a two-week trial of the program to see if they're starting to make some gains in in some of the functional components that the patients identified so um, there is some room to play a bit. You're not locked into that four weeks. It does not work for everybody, and there are patients that um, get started with the program and life circumstances and or whatnot get in, in the picture, and they have to stop and then revisit it later on. It does require a high level of commitment on the part of the person, so it does not always fit into everybody's schedule. So it is something to commit to if you're going to do it, but... 
Did that answer your question? Thank you. Uh, yes, and with stroke, um, I have not done it with a patient with stroke, uh, but depending on their movement, um, the residual movement after stroke, you could see some benefit from, you're just still affecting brain That's the movement, mm -hmm. motor, yeah. yeah, addressing motor symptoms. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we live at uh, Touchmark, and we have exercise. I have exercise, exercise class right now, three days a week, and I have park, special Parkinson exercising two, two afternoons a week. But is that the, would that be equivalent to what you're talking about here, or not? I go to a new neurologist, and the new neurologist is looking at me going to some kind of physical therapy. <laughs> I'm just wondering yeah. if I need another physical therapy program besides the one I seem to have. Well, it's, it sounds like it's kind of an exercise class, which is great, and I think you can do a lot. Um, I have done an exercise class in the past, and it looks like we have some people in our audience that have done a lot of them. Um, but it is challenging in an exercise class to really challenge a find that real challenging place where you can challenge enough that you're going to see change and not challenge a person too much that they're going to fall. So I think that there is lots of great benefit of the class. I would definitely recommend keeping it up. Um, but I think with a therapist working together, you can help decide you know, how to challenge yourself maybe more in the class if the class is enough. I would definitely recommend you know, the therapy piece as well just as an added bonus. And if you can help alter certain things you're already doing, Great. We have the exercise equipment there. I mean, we have the bikes, we have the the, the treadmills, we mm -hmm. have the, the whole thing with the arms. If I add some of that, would that be enough? Maybe. It would be bad. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I rarely tell someone that exercise is bad. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not selling a program by any means. We're just kind of giving you some information about certain programs. Um, I definitely think, though, um, you know, you might be able to be challenged within your current programs by having a therapist, you know, going to see a therapist and getting some information about what you struggle with that you might not even notice. Um, and also to really help... Um, you know, if you are doing a cycling program where you're just cycling to help get that high attentional focus, so challenge you in some way there. It looks like it, Cindy. Thank you, everybody, uh, once again for joining us today. Uh, just a little repeat uh, at the beginning. I talked about next month's topic is going to be. Um, elder care law, long-term planning, um, long-term care. Uh, and if you can uh, join us next month, plan on maybe a little bit longer. We will be sending out materials beforehand like we did today. If you didn't receive those materials, the handout that uh, Ingrid was talking about, I do have an electronic copy that I can either uh, email out to you or I can also mail it out from the Resource Center. Um, and we're very excited about these programs and hopefully this is something we're working towards here at the PRC and so the more we hear from the community that we want programs like Big and Loud, um, LSVT, Delay the Disease, the more we can go back to our board of directors and say this is what we're working towards and we need this in our community. So call me. <laughs> Thank you very much everybody.